can you um, talk us through how a Mars um, city might come to be developed? Um, give us a give us a kind of vision from the first explorers arriving and creating a small base to uh, a city of um, a few hundred um, thousand, let's say. Right. Okay. Um, and talk a little bit about the kind of um, terraforming and the kind of uh, uh, the kind of visions for cities that you describe in the book, which I found absolutely fascinating. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so first of all, I want to contrast it with a vision that is out there that I do not believe is correct. And this is the one that Elon Musk has set forth, where he's going to build a fleet of starships and he's going to fly a thousand of them to Mars in one year with a hundred people each. So there's a hundred thousand people landed on Mars, and then the next year they'll land another hundred thousand, and the next and the next, and then they'll have a million people on Mars inside of a decade after the first landing. Um, it basically, sort of the D-Day Normandy beach approach. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I do not think this is uh, practical. I don't believe that's how this will happen at all. Uh, it, it's not possible because. To feed 100,000 people, you have to have extensive infrastructure on Mars, growing food, etc. Now, you can't feed... Why you could feed the troops on Normandy Breach by f taking Liberty ships across the channel, uh, it only would take less than a day to take a steamer across the channel, and they could carry 10,000 tons of cargo each. Uh, a starship takes six months to get to Mars. It carries 100 tons. So th this is not possible. So the way... Mars cities are going to grow. They're going to grow organically, okay? That is, first, you might take one starship to Mars, and you land 100 people. And yes, and the starship can bring enough food for 100 people to last a long time. And then they build greenhouses where they're growing food. And now you have a, 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 some kind of agricultural base on Mars, and now you can bring in a couple of hundred more people. And now they can expand the greenhouses, but not now, the initial greenhouses are probably built with glass and other components brought from Earth. But what you want to do is create on Mars the capabilities to make glass or perhaps transparent plastics so that you can build the greenhouses on Mars. And even not just the glass or the plastic, the transparent part, but the pipes, the plumbing, make all that on Mars. So you need to have the capability of making plastics or metals on Mars to make plumbing and even perhaps the motors for pumping the water around. Okay, now eventually, okay, so as you're doing this, you're able to build more and more greenhouses with less mass needing to be transported from Earth, okay, for each greenhouse. Maybe a, a, at a certain point, you're only taking the computer chips that are running the greenhouse, but they don't weigh anything to speak of. So, so you need to build this agricultural and industrial base on Mars. And as you do this, you're creating the capacity to house more people, to feed more people. And the more people you have there, the more people you have creating more capacities, okay, and so forth. So that's how this thing will grow. And it'll grow organically from hundreds to thousands uh, to tens of thousands. Now, that's another thing. I do not believe that early Mars cities will be metropolises of a million people. Um, historically on Earth, there were only a very few cities of a million people until the 19th century. Ancient Rome had a million people, but that's because it was the center of an empire that had this tremendous logistics organization bringing grain from Egypt and North Africa and everywhere to an aqueducts and this whole thing. In order to support a million people, you have to be able to transport lots of materials from far away to the place where the people are. And until Mars has railroads and uh, other forms of convenient long-distance uh, transport of not just people but materials, uh, you're not going to have cities of a million people. You'll have cities of, of, of tens of thousands. And so that's why my vision of future Martian cities is perhaps cities on the order of 50,000, which is the size of Renaissance of Lawrence, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so you... And, and But that also shows, or Rembrandt's Amsterdam, okay, uh, that you can have very creative cultures within cities on, on that scale, okay? Hard to do it in a city of 200 people. No, okay, that's too small. But tens of thousands, you could certainly have uh, very creative cultures. Um, 
there's some technologies needed that would help that a lot, artificial intelligence to, uh, to create uh, more skills within a somewhat limited population, um, et cetera. But yes, so that's how this will grow. Now, um, initially, Martian settlements can be funded by the organizations that are sponsoring them, which could be nations, could be religious sects, uh, 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 groups, um, could be, uh, uh, you know, um, nonprofit organizations of people that believe in a certain cause and uh, a certain uh, uh, political ideology or something, that this is the ideal way to work, whatever. But once it gets started, okay, while the home front organization can continue to be of help, it increasingly has to earn its own way, okay? So, so to take uh, some comparisons, um, if you look at three of the most remarkable uh, settlement initiatives that occurred in the past 400 years and remarkable because they didn't have a commercial motivation. If something has a commercial motivation, it'll just happen. You, you can't stop it from happening. Okay. But things that don't have commercial motivation must have some kind of other. So if you look at the pilgrims coming to Massachusetts, the Mormons going to Utah, or the Jews going to Palestine, okay, in the 1600s, the 1800s, and the 20th century, what you had was strong home front organizations sponsoring this thing, um, and the organizations themselves being motivated by transcendent purposes, that is, non-commercial purposes. Uh, uh, they want to do it. But once these uh, settlements get started and grow in order to thrive, they must have some way of earning their own way. So they're not started to make money, but once they are there, they need to make money. Because even when Mars, you know, is making all its own iron and all its own glass and making steel and pipes and all this, it's still going to need to import some stuff from Earth that's going to need to have cash income. Okay. Um, so what are the sources of cash income for a Mars colony? There's a variety of tertiary sources that people talk about, like tourism and sponsoring scientists. And sure, okay, but that's that's you can't base an economy on that. Okay, one thing though that Mars will be extremely strong in is innovation itself. A Mars settlement will be a group of technologically adept people in a frontier environment where they're forced to innovate um, to meet the challenges of that environment. They're going to be forced to innovate in numerous areas, including energy including um, uh, automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, and biotechnology, to name just a few. That is biotechnology because they're going to have extremely limited acreage, and they're going to have to have extremely productive crops, so they're not going to be held back from doing genetic engineering or other forms of biotechnology. They're going to cut loose. Nuclear power. Nuclear power has stagnated on Earth because we have immense quantities of fossil fuels. There are no fossil fuels on Mars I mean, you can make them if you have another source of energy, but that's besides the point. You have to have the other source of energy. Solar power is weak. Wind is weak. Hydroelectric is non-existent. Nuclear is the way to go. But now we have some nuclear on Earth, but we've allowed to st it to stagnate. Um, the reactors that we have, and I'm a fan uh, of the nu current nuclear technology, but they're based on the very same design that Rickover introduced for nuclear submarines in the 1950s. And... While they work, absolutely, they only get about 1% of the energy out of the uranium uh, that is mined. Um, on Mars, you're not going to want to do that. On Mars, you want to get 90% or something comparable. So you're going to want breeder reactors. We haven't developed breeder reactors on Earth because two things. One is, uh, even at 1% of the energy, the nuclear fuel is only 5% of the cost of nuclear power. And secondly is... The last thing people who are in the utility industry want to do with nuclear power is try something new because it's hard enough to get a, a, a pressurized water reactor, a rickover reactor that's been around for 70 years licensed, let alone try to get the regulators to approve something they're not familiar with. So the, the hyper-regulation of nuclear power has been uh, prohibitive to innovation, whereas the Martians are going to want innovation and they're going to want fusion power, okay? Yes, there's some fusion research going on on Earth today, 
But look, you know, the international program ITER, um, it was begun in the 1980s. They still haven't completed it. They're really taking their time. Uh, the, 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 the Martians are going to want to really make this happen uh, because, once again, no fossil fuels. And because deuterium, which is the fuel for fusion power, is five times as common on Mars as it is on Earth. Now, an analogy here is um, steam power. Um, the British invented the steam engine. Americans invented the steamboat. And it's very interesting because the very first steamboat was demonstrated to the Constitutional Convention in 1787. It was called the Perseverance, just like the rover on Mars today. Uh, and the first commercially successful steamboat, uh, which occurred in the early 1800s, the Claremont, was financed by Robert Livingston, who was the very same person who uh, negotiated the Louisiana Purchase for Thomas Jefferson. And Livingston owned large amounts of land in the West, and he wanted it to be developed. And, okay, what's the point here? Well, in early America, the only real good highways were the rivers, and sailboats have a hard time on rivers. Uh, steam was the way to go. The British, they were using steam engines to pump water out of coal mines, but if you're using a steam engine for that purpose, it can weigh any amount, doesn't matter, and it can be extremely inefficient, it doesn't matter, because you have an infinite supply of fuel right there at the coal mine. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want to do steam boats, the boat, the engine has to be, relatively speaking, more compact, okay, it needs to be more efficient, the amount of fuel you're carrying matters, okay, and so they were driven to develop compact, high-pressure steam engines, which it, are enabling for steam boats, and then with a certain amount, a little extra improvement, railroads, which becomes the transformative invention of the 19th century. So the needs of the frontier cause people to look at making steam engines, taking steam, which already existed, but now making it much more efficient so it could do boats and then railroads, um, to open up the frontier. And this transforms the world, not just the frontier. And uh, so I believe that for the same reason that Americans invented the steamboat, Martians are going to uh, lead the way on fusion power. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as I mentioned, that biotechnology and artificial intelligence, because if you've got cities of 10,000, 50,000 people, you don't have the same kind of division of labor you have here on Earth. Um, you, you, you need to have technologies that will allow almost anyone to do almost anything so you can have the same array of skills in a population of 50,000 as you currently have on Earth with 8 billion. Um, and it should be clear that in making all these innovations, the Martians, they need it for themselves. They'll be able to license these innovations on Earth uh, for profit, and they will tremendously benefit life on Earth by creating mm. these innovations. Mm. Um, so um, just as... And, and, and to come back to this, by the way, there's a very interesting book called Voyagers to the West by a historian named Bernard Baolin. And what he did was he looked at the British records of who was coming to America during the late colonial period, the 1750s, 60s, and early 1770s, because the British actually kept records of this uh, during this period. And it's interesting who was the dominant group among the emigrants. It was not the urban poor. No, it wasn't the slum population. They didn't go. Uh, it was not the rich. No, they had a reason to go. Uh, and it, although there were a significant number of farmers, they're underrepresented compared to another group, which is way overrepresented. And this is craftsmen, people like blacksmiths and carpenters and stonemasons. Uh, are way overrepresented in the population coming to uh, late colonial America. And, well, that's because people are building cities in America. People are, there's a lot more construction going on. There's all this. But also, the thing is, what this gives rise to, so relatively speaking, a technologically adept population compared to the average. Um, and you get this culture of gadgeteering in America. Um, and, um, and these people are literate and they set up 
uh, magazines like Popular Mechanics for themselves in which they exchange ideas on how to build stuff. And they are especially interested in labor-saving gadgets um, because there's a tremendous labor shortage in America. And this is the kind of culture you get in the so-called Yankee ingenuity. And uh, the Martians, by comparison, will be far, I mean, will far more technologically adept than the average person on Earth. Uh, and so I think you'll have a tremendous culture of invention. Uh, other sources of income for Mars will be supporting the mining of the asteroids. Mm. There, People talk about uh, precious metals in the asteroid belt. They are there. But those um, mining operations will have to be supported, and it's about 100 times easier uh, to transport things to the asteroid belt from Mars than from Earth. And so what San Francisco was to the 49ers, the gold rush miners here in America, uh, Mars will be to the asteroid belt. The, I mean, the way to get rich during a gold rush is not to mine gold, it's to sell shovels and blue jeans to gold miners. And that's how San Francisco got rich. That's how Mars is going to get rich. And then finally, uh, real estate development. Because once you actually have cities on Mars, and they're able now to take land and turn it into habitable land by putting domes over it and supplying it with power and other utilities, uh, that becomes something they can sell. 